I'm now found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for soft of the loudest praise. Teach me some. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children, 
God is love, God is love. Praise Him, praise Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Love Him, love Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Love Him, love Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Thank Him, thank Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Thank Him, thank Him, all you little children. God is love, God is love.
abide with me Fast falls the evening's height The darkness deepens Lord, with me abide When other helpers fail in comfort So abide with me Swift to its close Ebbs out life's little day Earth's joys grow dim Its glories pass
Whoa. 
after the service. It'll be in the classroom, so if you're part of that team, please come meet with us. And there, tonight, there's no Awana or youth group. There won't be Awana or youth group tonight or next week due to Easter. And on April 9th, we have our Easter service this coming Sunday. The service will be at 10 a.m., and the brunch will be at 11, and then there will be an Easter egg hunt at noon. And if you intend on coming to the brunch, uh, rather you're bringing food or not, please sign up on the sheet at the end of the, in the bulletin at the end of the hallway and mark how many people are coming with you and what you want to bring for food so that we'll know how many tables to prepare and uh, so forth and so on with uh, preparations for it. Uh, so please sign up for that. April 15th, there's a ladies brunch and there's a sign up for that as well at the end of the hallway. That's April 15th at 10.30 a.m. And on April uh, 17th, there will be release time. 
that's where we'll take the kindergartners through fourth graders from the local school and bring them here. And uh, that's at 115 to 215 on April 17th. April 22nd, there's a bridal shower for Shelly King and Caleb Walcott. And if you would like to participate in that, uh, there's, there either is or there will be a sign-up sheet on the bulletin as well. Uh, if you would like to go to that, you can just communicate that with uh, one of them or with me, and I'll pass it on to them so that we'll, again, know how many people to prepare for. And that's at 1 p.m. on April 22nd. And April 26th is our quarterly business meeting, and that'll be at 7 p.m., and if you are part of the church constituency, if, if you have that or if you want to be uh, part of that as a member, then uh, please fill out the information sheet that's at the bottom of the stairs on that table uh, in the hallway uh, and update any sort of information, whether it's your address or your email or whatever. Uh, update your personal information. And if there are no updates, just write no change. Uh, but we are trying to get uh, something turned in for each person that's in the constituency so that we'll know for sure uh, that we have accurate information. Uh, and if you have a bulletin and you see the little envelope in your bulletin, that's for the Deacon's Fund. And the Deacon's Fund is used to help people in the church with various needs that they have. Um, so anything put in that today will go straight to that. And it will be uh, given to someone in need uh, in the church or in the community. And uh, also there will be no membership class on April 30th or May 7th. So if you're in the membership class right now, please talk to Pat Connor about that. There will be no class April 30th or May 7th. Um, so with that, let me pray, and then we'll read Scripture. Um, okay, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us through this week, and thank you for the, uh, the beautiful weather. Thank you for um, just uh, bringing us all together here today. We know that we're here for a purpose, and I ask that you would speak to each one of us individually and to us as a body that we would know what it is that you're wanting for us and what you want us to do to participate in glorifying you. Uh, we love you, and uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, could you please stand as we read scripture? Okay. Isaiah 53, verse 3 through 7 and verse 11. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet he esteemed him stricken, stricken by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities.
invite you to sit down, but uh, we're going to be singing Hosanna. And when Jesus went into Jerusalem, nobody was sitting down. They were all standing worshiping.
are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to come and sing and really through our song recognize the greatness of who you are and how you see each and every individual heart. And you, you know us. You know exactly who we are. You know what we bring. You know the baggage we carry. You know the hurt that we have. You know exactly what we've been through in our life. And yet you deal with each and every one of us in such a unique way, Lord. I'm so thankful for the love that you have for us. I do pray for each and every person here that you would speak to their hearts, that they would put away whatever it is that's going on through this week, and they'd be able to focus and spend this time just learning from your word. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and uh, release Junior Church. Junior Church is for those 3 through 12. They have Bible lessons. <laughs> they have uh, snacks and arts and crafts. And today they have palm branches. Yeah. We will pray for her. Yeah. That's true. She didn't hit me on the way in with one. You know what? I'm not praying. <laughs> it's always easier to feel uh, in the Easter spirit, I think, when it's nice and springy outside. It was beautiful yesterday. Let's go ahead and pray one more time before we open up his word. Father God, we do thank you for the, your word. We do thank you for this Easter season. We thank you for this spring season. We thank you for the reminder of the newness of life. We thank you for the reminder of the newness that each and every one of us can find. Uh, we can begin a new chapter, a new part of our story, and we can do that simply by coming to recognize and acknowledge that we need you. God, I pray for anyone here that may need you. I pray for anybody here that may have uh, difficulty hearing what you have to say, Lord. I, it's hard sometimes. We carry so, much, so many things with us. We have difficulties at home sometimes. We have difficulties at work. We have difficulties in our past. Maybe even we've had difficulty with church or in church. And so sometimes that can get in the way, Lord. But I pray that today we just focus on what you have to say and what your word says. Because you're coming again and you will, we will, each and every one of us will stand and give an account, not for how others lived, but for ourselves, Lord. And so I do pray that we keep that at the forefront of our mind as we come before you. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, could you go ahead and play that video for me? their big reveal. They had practiced this already. And so they brought the, they had practiced this. That's a steel ball. And they're trying to demonstrate that the glass of this Tesla Cybertruck is unbreakable. 
And so he's like, hey, go ahead and throw the steel ball at the window. And I've seen the other one where there's a, a Jeff told me today that the reason it didn't work is because there was multiple prototypes. And one of them had a working engine and one of them had the tough glass. And they brought the one with the working engine out and the, the guy in the back is going, no, no, no. And then he's like, yeah. And he just chucks it at it anyway. And it breaks, right? And so you can see Elon Musk, he's like, yeah, there's room for improvement. He's like, that was a letdown, right? Because I saw the other video. They throw it at the window and it actually bounces off. It's pretty awesome. It actually bounces off the window. And so he's all excited. There's supposed to be this big moment where they're supposed to show that this glass is completely unbreakable. And instead, this ball just bounces right off. And it's kind of embarrassing, right? And it's not what anybody was expecting. And I know it's a random video, right? But that's how my mind works. Because as I was reading through uh, Palm Sunday and I was going over and over this in my head, and the more and more I thought about it, the more I thought back to this moment. Because I remember this. This happened in 2019. They were all excited about this amazing thing that was coming out and how it was this huge letdown. And as I'm reading through Palm Sunday multiple different times, it keeps saying at the top, it keeps saying the triumphant entry. The triumphal entry, triumphant entry, even on the header in Scripture. That's what it says. It says the triumphal entry. And when you read it, the more you read it, the less triumphant it seems. And so my question as I was reading through this was, is this the triumphant entry or is there something else to come? Is there something else to come? Is this just a taste? Is this just a foreshadowing of something that one day there really will be a moment in time when there is something that is not a letdown at all, but is a culmination of human history into this one giant triumphant entry that finally takes place? And so I want to take a look at that today. So we're going to go through a lot of history. So you're going to have to follow me through the weeds to get where we're going, okay? I'm going to do my best to drag you through there nicely. John 12, 12 through 13, if you're sitting here and you're going, what is Palm Sunday? Why did you hand out palms? Why are they all around? You're going to have to be picking the little fibers up for seven years after this. Why, why do you have them? This is where we get this from. John 12, 12 through 13. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took b- branches of palm trees And went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So they're treating him like a king. They're treating him like a king, which is weird because they have a king. They have a king. They have King Herod. King Herod is ruling over Israel, and his wife is actually even Jewish. And so he's almost like a real Jewish king. But he is ruling over Israel as a king that has been set up by a Roman government. And so the Roman government allowed him to be the king. And so they don't actually have real freedom. Israel doesn't. They haven't had a real free king since 586 B.C. when Babylon came through and destroyed Jerusalem. They have not had a real king since then. Any other time that they had an opportunity to have a king, it was a king that had been placed there by another government. And most of that time was spent completely in slavery to other nations. And so they have this desire for a real king to come. So over 586 years, they've been waiting for this opportunity to finally have the real king, to finally go back to what it used to be, like in the Old Testament, where they were free, where they could make their own decisions, where they weren't in charge, they weren't ruled by the Roman government. And like you think about how old our nation is. Our nation isn't even that old. They've been 586 years without freedom. And yet they knew from the Old Testament they were promised of a time when a king would come through and he would finally rid Israel of all these fake kings and he would set up an eternal kingdom that would continue for all of eternity. So they're waiting for this king and in steps Jesus into this society. And so in this moment, we call it Palm Sunday because they're waving all these palm branches. And the palm branch, when you think of a palm branch, basically think of like the bald eagle for the United States, 
right? What does the bald eagle represent for the United States? Freedom, right? It's independence, it's freedom. It's like that strength and the beauty of having that freedom. In the same thing, palm branches represented that in a great way for the people of Israel. They actually had it all around the walls of the inside of, the, uh, of Solomon's temple. Do you see this? Inside Solomon's temple. These are palm trees. They have them in here. They even have them inside the Holy of Holies. They have these palm trees. They're even inscribed on the doors, it says, that separate them all the way out into the courtyard. So palm trees, this is this huge symbol of, its, of freedom and of Israel. And so it become like the thing that they rallied behind. It had become the thing they rallied behind in a great way. They, they did things like waving the date palm branches, and they did that during the Feast of Booths, which is a really important week for the Jewish people, and that was something that they did during that feast. They also, yeah, I, I mentioned that, the nationalistic hope, but it, we get that from First Maccabees, um, some Jewish writers, there's Jewish history here, on the 23rd day of the second month. In the 171st year, the Jews entered it with praise. When it says it, it's talking about Jerusalem in context. But I didn't want to put the whole thing up there. Uh, And palm branches. They did this already. This is 100 years years before Jesus. This happened in Jewish history. The same thing. They came in and they were waving palm branches because they had this successful, well, even though it was short-lived, victory. They also appeared on the coins that the Jewish nationalists produced during the war with the Romans that would come in AD 66 to AD 70. And so it is this sign of this is our guy. When they have this moment and Jesus is coming in and they're waving these palm branches, they're thinking freedom, they're thinking independence, they're thinking like our version of 1776. They're like, finally, we have a real leader who's going to come in and he's going to establish us. We're going to have freedom. We're going to be able to worship the way we want to worship. We're going to be able to live the way we want to live. We can finally rid ourselves of these Romans. That's what they're thinking. That's where their mindset is. That, and so that's what they're looking at. And so this triumphant entry, they're doing this because they think that Jesus is a king. And they're not wrong, just kind of wrong. You'll see. They, they say Hosanna. Hosanna is taken from uh, Psalm 118, verse 15. And it's the Hebrew word that means is this idea right there, save us. That's what most people believe it comes from, right there. Save us, but that Hebrew word that would be there. And so, save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. And then look at verse 26. Does that sound familiar? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When did they say that? They just did, right? When Jesus is coming in, they are quoting from this. They're ascribing to Jesus the fact that this is the guy. This is the king that we've been waiting for. Then he says he comes in the name of the Lord because they had been promised a Messiah who would be sent by God and this king would be successful because he would be from God. God would send him himself. And so they're saying, Hosanna. Then they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they just outright call him king of Israel. So they are completely thinking this idea. Okay, Jesus is here. Now we can finally be free. We can finally be free. We can finally, once again, understand what it's like to be completely free to worship and to live. So where are they getting this idea from? What led to this moment of Palm Sunday? Because it's not like, you don't, you don't normally just be like, hey, you, you make a good king. Get in there. Right? It's like, it doesn't usually happen. Uh, I know Kanye West tried with presidency, but it's not usually how it goes, right? You can't usually just be like, I'm cool. I should do it. Um, not how it goes. So how do we get here with Jesus? Uh, John 11, 55 through 57. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And this is, we're leading right up to this. Jesus is coming in right at this time of Passover. So this is right before this whole situation. And many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Look at verse 56. And they were looking for Jesus. So Jesus has made a name for himself. Why do you think Jesus had made a name for himself? This is towards the end of his ministry. So he's already done all of what? 
Yeah, he's been busy, right? He's been healing the sick. He's been raising the dead to life. He's been feeding. One time he feeds 5,000 men with five loaves and two fish. He, another time he feeds over 3,000 people. And so you can imagine if you are a poor person living in an agrarian culture that thrives only off of like farming, and then you got a guy who can just bam, make food, solid leader. Not bad. Who will take him? I'd work for that guy. It's like, work could be great. What's work? 10 minutes. Yeah. You just have to like make five loaves. That's it. Yeah, he does the rest. It's all right. amazing. Like, so they're, they're all about this. They're like, this Jesus guy is going to be a great king. They're like, they're so excited. And so they were looking for Jesus and they're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on with Jesus? And they're connecting it back to something that just took place. And they're all asking this question. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. They're upset for the exact reasons that the people are excited because they're in power and they're like, yeah, we can't really compete with the whole Jesus thing. It's like, we have rules. He's making food out of nothing. We're in trouble. And so they're upset because a whole bunch of people are being swayed by this Jesus guy who came in, and they don't believe in him. And so they're upset because they think Jesus is some kind of fake king or fake prophet. And so they're upset, and they're mad. Let's see why. Look how bad this is. John 12, 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. That should raise a bell, right? Ring a bell. Lazarus whom Jesus had raised from the dead. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Why do you think they wanted to see Lazarus? Yeah, if you heard somebody came back from the dead, you're going to be like, nah. It's like, that. Ah, I don't think so. That doesn't seem like a real thing. And so they're all like, hey, we know Lazarus. Let's go see Lazarus. And so Lazarus, what do you think he's doing about this story? Like, if I'm Lazarus, it's the only thing I talk about forever. It's like, eventually, God's going to have to kill me to take me to heaven because I'm going to annoy people. I'm like, hey, did you know I was dead? They're like, yes, you told us 47 times. Yeah, but I was like super dead. Yeah, we know we were there, but I was really, really dead. We really, really know. Like, he'd be crazy, right? And so Lazarus, he's telling all these people about it. He's talking about it. So there's all this stuff going on, going, okay, if Jesus can feed us and he can bring us back from the dead, he's going to be a, not only a great king, he would make a wicked commander. Because like we could go fight, lose, and he'd be like, pew, 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 pew. we have a new army. He's like, we're back again. He's like, people would be losing their minds. Who wants to fight a zombie army? Nobody. And so they're all super pumped about Jesus. This is what they're really doing. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Can you imagine being so hardened that Lazarus is like, hey, I was dead. Now I'm not. Jesus did it. And they're like, we should kill him. It's like, yeah, that didn't, I didn't work great the first time. So like, new plan. <laughs> like, don't do that. And, but that was their plan. He was dead. Let's make him dead again. Uh, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And so they're seeing this, and like, this is a real problem. People are not listening to us anymore, and they're listening to this Jesus guy, because he can do miracles, he's making a difference in people's lives, and we're busy yelling at everybody. And they're like, we need to get back to being in charge. And so the people are excited, the religious people are upset. And so as Jesus comes in, there's this huge tension. Everybody's wondering, what's Jesus going to do? What's he going to do? I mean, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now he's coming in, and they're thinking he's coming here. And look how he comes in. Except we'll we'll go there real quick. But Jesus has a different plan in mind. The people are really excited to uh, the people are really excited for Jesus to be king. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and religious leaders are really excited for Jesus to be dead. And Jesus is telling them what the plan is in Matthew twenty seventeen through eighteen. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. This is, he's on his way there. So on his way, before all this happens, Jesus tells them his plan. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, 
flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. He lays out the plan for them before they get there. He's like, hey, basically, I'm, I'm warning you guys. This is what it's going to be like. So I'm going to go into Jerusalem. There's going to be some wild stuff going on. Okay, don't, don't be distracted because this is why I'm going to Jerusalem. But it says that it was hidden from the disciples so they didn't understand, but that they would remember this moment when Jesus came back. And so he tells them the plan. And now look what happens. He reveals more here too. In Matthew 21, 1 through 4. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. What's that word? Humble. Humble. And mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. So usually a conquering king, a king going to war, would ride a horse. A conquering king who was just successful in battle would be coming back on a horse because no king is going out to fight on a donkey. It's embarrassing. Like, it's not happening, right? So a donkey is a symbol of peace. And so here comes Jesus in humility saying, I'm coming in peace. And the people are like, he's coming to set up a kingdom. And then the religious leaders are like, we don't care. We're just going to kill him. And Jesus is telling them the whole time, this is what I'm fulfilling. They're like, he's like, you're not wrong. I am the Messiah. Because this was predicted in Zechariah 9.9. This was predicted that that future king that would make everything right, um, that he would come into Jerusalem on a donkey. And they knew this. They knew the Old Testament very well. And so he is living this out in front of them. So they're thinking, we are so right. We knew it. He's doing miracles. He's raising people from the dead. He can feed us. And now he's representing himself the way that the Messiah should. So they're thinking they nailed it. So they're super excited. They're waving their palm branches because look at what the next verses are in this prophecy. In verse 10, I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. For I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. So they're thinking, he's coming and he's going to fight. And so imagine that you've seen this guy do all of these miracles. You've seen him raise somebody from the dead, and you believe that he's coming to fight your enemy. They're like, this is going to be so cool. Like, they're waiting for it. Like, if he can make people see, do you think he's going to make them blind? Like, you know what I mean? They're going through in their head. What's, what's going to happen? What's he going to do? This is where they're at. This is what they expected. But this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. And so it's... It seemed like it was making sense, but there's something else going on here that we have, to, we have to recognize. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And when he drew near and he saw the city, it says he wept over it. Two times it says that Jesus wept. There's the one famous verse that everybody has memorized because it's Jesus wept, right? And it's like a nice soft cry. This is not the word that means nice soft cry here. This is he just breaks down. So here's Jesus, and he's coming into Jerusalem, and he sees, he sees Israel, and he just breaks down, and he weeps. He weeps over what could be. He weeps over what's about to happen. His heart is broken for them, because what we're going to find out, what we're going to see, is that they completely missed why he was there. Matthew 22, and when he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it. This is him just losing it, saying, would that you... Even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. So he's saying, yes, I came on a donkey signifying peace. Yes, I'm coming in as that Messiah to bring peace. But he's saying, I wish you understood how I had to achieve that peace. Because they're expecting him to come in and fight. But Jesus is going to bring them peace through his death. And so he's saying, I wish you understood 
I wish you, could, I wish you got it. If you're a parent and you've ever been trying to have this conversation with your kid where they're going off the wrong direction and your heart is just broken because you know what that path looks like and you're like, no, don't do it and they won't listen to you and they finally, they step off and they go that direction. This is how Jesus feels. He's looking at Israel. He loves Israel. He sees what's going on there and his heart is broken because he's like, I'm trying to show you. I'm giving you all of the signs. I'm doing everything to bring myself to you so that you would recognize me and they don't recognize him. And so his heart is broken. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus knows what's about to happen in around AD 70 when Rome destroys Jerusalem. And they literally do that. They go and they start ripping apart the temple at Solomon's temple, the most beautiful one that um, any of the Jewish people ever had. Uh, they tear it apart stone by stone. They tear this down. And he, he knows that's coming. And so the people are excited because they think a conquering king is coming. Jesus is heartbroken because he knows that they don't understand that the only way for peace is for him to die. And so it works in such an odd way because he had to die to save you and, I, and me. Because we all suffer from this thing called sin. We all struggle with it. I was born with it. You were born with it. You don't have to teach your kids how to say no. They learn it super fast. You don't have to teach your kids how to do something wrong. It's instinctively inside of them. They are born with this. And the only way that we can be separated from our sin and to be forgiven is if the punishment was paid. And that punishment is death. But that death that death had to be paid by someone who didn't owe the same thing. So I can't die for my daughter because I'm a sinner and she's a sinner, so I can't go in her place. And so in steps Jesus, and he comes to the earth, and he lives a perfect, sinless life for 33 years, never did anything wrong. And so he is offering himself as the sacrifice. And so it has to be heartbreaking that the way to save us and the way actually to save Israel is for his people Israel to reject him. Isn't that sad? It's like to get there, the people I love the most have to hate me because they're the ones that are going to be yelling, crucify him. But I love them so much that I'll take their hate and pay for it on the cross. That's what Jesus is doing. Because they were looking for a king. And so they give him this amazing entry. And something even better than a king came. The real Messiah. God with skin on. And they missed it. Israel wasn't ready. And so there's this weird thing that happens. So it's, this is most likely the next morning. You're probably looking at Tuesday. And so Tuesday, Jesus is on his way to the temple. He's on his way to the temple. And along the way, he sees this fig tree. He sees this fig tree, and he sees from where he is that there's leaves on this fig tree. So he goes over to the fig tree, and the way figs work is that usually fruit and the leaves come either at exactly the same time, or the fruit comes first and then the leaves come. So if he sees leaves, what should he expect to be on that? Fruit. And so he sees it, and he goes, it's okay, it's time. So he goes over to this fig tree, and there's leaves, but there's no fruit. And so Jesus curses it, and then he keeps moving. And if you're reading in the Bible, you're like, what? That didn't seem necessary. Like, okay, he cut down a tree. That doesn't seem like a thing I need in Scripture. He didn't actually cut it down, but he, he curses it, and it withers up. And so he says to this tree, cursed are you. And then he continues, and he goes forward to the temple. Because what he's actually doing is he's showing that this fig tree is a representation of Israel. All of the signs were there. They had this temple that had been rebuilt. They had priests. They had the law. They had the history. And now they had the Messiah standing in front of them who is literally living out all of the promises of the Old Testament of that the Messiah would accomplish. And he's saying everything is there. Every sign is there. And he said, but something's missing. It's the fruit. 
They were so close. They were so close. So he gets to the temple. And Jesus enters the temple and he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So Jesus, he curses this fig tree as an example of what was wrong with Israel. And then he goes into the temple, the place where the glory of God had dwelled. And once again, the glory of God is inside the temple. And they didn't accept him. They missed it again. The very Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, stepped into the temple. And instead of recognizing Jesus, you have this area that is called the court of the Gentiles. It's the only area where somebody that was not Jewish could come in and offer prayers to God. And in this court of Gentiles, instead of being a place of prayer for them, you have all these people selling stuff and they're profiting off of religion and they're profiting off of God and they're making this money and they're selling things and they're cheating people in the very area where the Gentiles should be praying. And so Jesus could very well walk in, see all these money changers, see the sheep, see all these things that would be offered up as sacrifices. All these animal noises are going off and you have all this happening. And maybe even I wonder if tucked in the corner, there wasn't one or two Gentiles who had come to recognize God, who were trying to pray with all this chaos going in. And he walks in and he sees it and he's like, are you kidding me? How far have we fallen? How far have we fallen? And so he overturns, the, he overturns the temple. He overturns the temple. And along the way, look what happens. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children, I love this, the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were saying, this is him. This is the Messiah. A Messiah would do something like this. They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these people are saying? And Jesus said, yes. Have you never read? That is as much of an insult as you can give to a Pharisee. It seems like nothing to us. Have you never read? To them, it would be like, this is my whole life. I have that memorized since I was four. Like, that's what they're thinking in their head. And he goes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And so Jesus is showing that just like that fig tree, Israel was unready to receive their Messiah. And so what should have been an amazing triumphant entry is instead Jesus on his way to his own death. That's what's going on here. And so I want to go real, man, I want to go to Ezekiel eleven twenty three. 23, but I want you to see what's happening here, okay? So you have, this would have been the temple, and this is the Mount of Olives up here. And so you would be walking down in here through, this is an eastern, this would be called the eastern gate right in this area. And so Jesus is coming from the Mount of Olives, right? And look what Ezekiel eleven twenty three 23 says. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. So this is in the Old Testament. If the glory of the Lord is in the temple, on the Ark of the Covenant, and it goes towards the east mountains, where are we going? We're going to Mount of Olives. And so in Ezekiel, it says that the glory of the Lord left the temple, and it went and it dwelled on the Mount of Olives, waiting. That's what it says in Ezekiel. Okay? And so look at what Jesus would have seen. This is what Jesus, this is modern day. Obviously, this is not a picture of exactly what Jesus would have seen. But this is Jesus from coming from the Mount of Olives when he would have wept over Jerusalem. This is what he's looking at. When he's coming into the city, this is what it is. This is now that this is like the Dome of the Rock area. This is where the temple would have been in this area here. And so this would have been this magnificent temple that Jesus is coming down into. And he sees all of this with all of this going on. And so once again, the glory of the Lord was rested on the Mount of Olives. Here he was again. And he walks in and they didn't recognize him. And then we move to Acts 1. And this is when Jesus ascends into heaven. And where were they? That's weird. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called, they were on the Mount of Olives. 
And so the glory of the Lord had rested on the Mount of Olives. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, went down into the city. And now when Jesus ascends, after he comes back from the dead, and he goes back to be with Jesus, he does it from where? The Mount of Olives. Wow. That must be a coincidence. You know Jesus and coincidences. It's just always happening, right? That must be a coincidence. Maybe not. Maybe not. Zechariah 14, 2 through 5. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And look at verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the... Well, that's crazy. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split into two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. This is the real triumphant entry, because this hasn't happened yet. And so that means that Jesus, when in the Old Testament, when the glory of the Lord left, it went and it stayed on the Mount of Olives. Then you have Jesus himself, where history believes that most of the time he was actually sleeping around the Mount of Olives because there was a lot of people would do that, especially during the big feasts when Jerusalem would be absolutely packed and there'd be no room there. Many travelers would stay in the Mount of Olives. So it's believed that actually Jesus did most of his ministry back and forth, often from Mount of Olives. He used it as a place of operation many times. And so the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus goes back up to God on the Mount of Olives, and it says that he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. And that's going to be the real triumphant entry. Because the one we saw, he was going to conquer death. But when he comes a second time, there's no plans for losing. There's no plans for losing. So when he comes a second time, we see that in Zechariah even. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. And so after this, before Jesus, before Jesus dies, almost all of his conversation is about two topics. One is he's trying to tell them, hey, I'm going to go away for a while. And when I come back, that's going to be an important thing. And then the only other, the other thing that he talks about a lot is he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Those are, two big, those are the two big things. So the coming of the Holy Spirit has obviously happened. We see that in Acts chapter 2. But Jesus says this, Well, watch yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the Mount of Olives. So every day he's going from the Mount of Olives into the Eastern Gate, into the temple. So over and over and over. And he's saying, hey, I'm going to go away. Be careful. Because I believe that what he's referencing in Zechariah is that is the Battle of Armageddon. We see it in Revelation 16. We see it in Revelation 19. If you'd like to read those, those really summarize exactly what he's talking about in Zechariah there. And so I believe that when Jesus comes again, he will come and he will once again rest on the Mount of Olives. This time he's coming as a conquering king. And what they were hoping for then, that the king would come, that the Messiah would come, that it would be amazing, it would be awesome, and what if an all-powerful being could come down and could actually lead us? What would that look like? We're going to get it. Because Jesus himself, it will be our king. He will be our Messiah. And we will live with him for all of eternity. And so we don't have to wonder. Because what he had promised to them, what they thought was about to happen, will happen one day. And they weren't ready for it. And he said, man, I wish you were ready when I was here. Which brings us to the point of all of that for this one moment right here. So don't miss it. How will he find you? If he did all of that, if he fulfilled all those prophecies, 
if he gave them sign after sign after sign, if it broke his heart to know that they didn't understand, if he did every single thing he, the, with what he gave us in the Old Testament, what he's shown us in the New Testament, what he says is going to come, if he's fulfilled that all the way down the line, and then he says that I'm coming again, how will he find you? Because they weren't ready. They were lacking the fruit. They were leaves. They had everything they should have, but no substance. They had the temple. They had the law. They had these rulers. They actually had the physical Messiah in front of them. And nothing happened. And so I wonder for us, as we sit in church, and they waited for a king for like 600 years. They were waiting and waiting, and they thought that was the day. We feel the same way sometimes because we feel like we've been waiting and waiting. And we feel like we don't have that freedom that we wish we had. We feel like we don't live the lives we wish we had. We still struggle with the fact that we lose loved ones and people hurt and people are evil and we deal with that and we have trouble in our marriages and we have trouble in our friendships and we have trouble in our government and we have trouble in our world and we have trouble in our life and we have trouble in our mind and we have trouble in our hearts and we have trouble with sin and we just deal with all of these things and we're sitting here and we're doing the same thing they were. We're waiting. And so over and over again, he goes, we go to Matthew 25 and he gives a parable of these 10 virgins. They're, when he uses the word virgins, bridesmaids. And the way the marriages would work then is that the husband would come and he would bring a processional with him. With him. And when he, the husband was ready, he would come and the bride always had to stay ready. And the bridesmaids had to be ready. And so he, here comes this man to come to get his wife. And it's a symbol that one day Jesus is coming. And how will he find you? And then right after that, he gives another parable in Matthew 25. He goes right into it. And he gives the parable of the talents. And he said, I gave this guy some, and I gave this guy some, and I gave this guy some. And I said, I'm coming back. Use these until I'm back. And so the king goes away. Does that sound familiar? Our king has gone away for a while. And he's given each and every one of us opportunity and time and a life. But he says, I'm coming back again. So he comes back. And to one, he says, wow, you were faithful. You were faithful. With little, here's much. To the next one, he says, wow, you were faithful. With little, here's much. And then he comes to the third one. And that one's like, yeah, the money you gave me, I buried it and stuck it in a hole because I know you're super mean. That's Ben's translation. It doesn't exactly say that, but he literally does dig a hole and put it in there because he was afraid of him. And so he says, you weren't faithful. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. And he's saying, I'm gone. He was telling his disciples, I'm going to be gone. But you're going to have a life to live. And in John 16, one of the very last things that he does say to his disciples is he says, do not fear, because the, this world, basically he says that this world is messed up, but do not fear because I have overcome the world. He leaves them with that, and he leaves you with that. But he says that he's coming back again. And I couldn't get over that in Palm Sunday as I read through it. And I, have, I could have preached this like 50 different sermons on Palm Sunday. There was so much there. But I just couldn't get over the fact that they weren't ready, even though they had everything. And my fear, my fear is that somebody in here won't be ready. You won't be ready. Even though we have his whole word. We have the Bible. And so many things get in the way. So many people are like, yeah, Ben, I want to come to God. But man, I hate church because I went to church and people in church are mean. I know. That's why we need Jesus. I won't argue with that. I'm a pastor. I hear mostly bad things. Right? I'm not arguing with you. People are messed up. They are evil. But you know what doesn't happen? Jesus doesn't come and come to you and say, hey, tell me all about those things that, that person did. No, oh, it says we will stand before him and you will give an account for your own life. And so don't let what somebody else has done be the reason that you are hesitant to come to Christ because they'll give an answer too. But so will you. And so you can't push it off on somebody else and say the reason I didn't come is because I saw so and so and they were such a hypocrite that I could never begin to believe in a God that they believed in. You mean 
They were exactly like the people Jesus saw. That's why he had to warn them to be faithful. That's why he had to warn them. Because there would be some that have all of the information and still miss it. I don't want it to be you. I love you guys. It weighs heavily on my heart. It weighs heavily on my heart. That there are people that come into this room, that come into this church, that they might walk out of this place and have never recognized that, you know what, that I will stand before a perfect and a holy God and I will give an account of my life. Not somebody else's, not what my spouse did to me, not what my friend did to me, not what my teacher or my pastor or my deacon or the person I sat next to. I won't give an account for that. I'll give an account for my life. And every excuse I've ever had will be stripped away because it'll be just me and it'll be God and he knows every single thing about you. There's nowhere to hide. And that would be terrifying if it wasn't for Jesus. Because that's what Jesus was saying. That's why he said, it breaks my heart that you don't understand that to bring you peace, I have to do it this way. So Jesus, he rides into Jerusalem. They treat him like a king. And within the same week, Many of the same people, because they're there for that feast. So it's a week-long feast. They're there for this feast. So some of the same exact people that are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're excited and they're going, freedom, I'm finally going to get it. We're going to get rid of these Romans when Jesus doesn't do it. They're the same people saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The same people that are mocking Jesus as he carries this cross and he can't anymore because he was beaten 39 times and he had a crown of thorns placed into his head and he was punched and he had his beard ripped out and they mocked him and they made fun of him and they hung him on a cross and they said, hey, you saved so many people, save yourself. And Jesus is bearing that. And he's on this cross as they're making fun of him and they're trying to humiliate him. And Jesus is thinking, if you only knew... If he, go, if he got down from that cross, we lose. We lose. So I'm sure all of Satan and the demons are cheering for that too. Yeah, Jesus, teach him a lesson. Come on down. Don't stay up there. Because if he came down, we lost. And so as they're making fun of him, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I say this every time, and I'll never stop saying it. That's not what I would say. I would say, Father, we're about to murk some people tonight. <laughs> like, that would be me, because I'm broken, but not Jesus. He stays there on the cross for you. And so he's coming again, and he's coming as a conquering king. In Revelation, it says he's coming on a horse. Why? It's no longer time for peace. It's time to separate the wheat from the chaff. It's time to see those who are real, those who believe in him. And he says, you will come with me forever. And those that aren't, they will be separated from Christ for all of eternity. And they will go away into outer darkness in a place called hell, where for all of eternity, they will suffer the loss of not being in the presence of God. And so I just couldn't get away from that in Palm Sunday. They had all of the information and they missed it. You now have the information. What are you going to do with it? You have a choice to make. Is, is Jesus who he says he is? Because if he is, then there's nothing we can do except give him our life. And if Jesus isn't, then you're wasting a lot of time coming to church on Sunday. Because there's nothing I can do for you. If you're looking for wisdom from me, I don't have it. Because this is what the Bible says, is we need him. We need him to make a difference in our life. We need him to save us. It's not changed. It's the same today. We're going to go ahead and come forward and uh, take communion. I want to pray real quick, though. I want to give you guys some time to think. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for this opportunity we have to be able to, to 
pause and consider who you are and what you've gone through and the fact that you're coming again. And maybe there's somebody sitting here that's thinking, I already knew all this. I knew he was coming again. But man, I, I needed that reminder this week, Lord, that you're coming to make all things right. And all the pain and the suffering and the heartache and the brokenness that we deal with, it's, it's coming to an end one day. And this is our only opportunity. We only get this one opportunity here on this earth to make a choice about who you are. And so I pray for each and every person here in this room that we would come to recognize our need for Jesus. All we have to do is say, Lord, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me in the way that I could never do. Make me right with God. And you do that for us, Lord. I pray that for each and every one here. I pray for anybody who's struggling with all the things that get in the way, with the things that are distractions in this world and the things that we use as an excuse to not follow you and the reasons we come up to want to reject who you are. But I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for your mercy. And I pray that when you come, we will be found faithful. We will be found as believers and we'll be found doing the work that you've laid before us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and hand out communion. Um, we're going to do it a little different. We've been trying to find a way to make sure everybody gets stuff uh, on time. And so we're going to hand out the bread and the cup at the same time, okay? So can you hand this to Eric? You're going to have you go down the middle. Have you take this side? You guys can go. Thanks. They're learning on the fly. Sorry. <laughs>
I want to read something from Hebrews 12, verse uh, 3 and 4. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So Christ shed his blood, and if you think about it, in the garden, he sweat blood and he began to shed blood when he was facing the will of the Father. And he shed will to be within, or he shed blood to be within the will of the Father. And we have not shed our own blood in our fight against sin. And in one sense, we don't have to, because Jesus faced our sin for us so that we don't have to. He shed his blood and he died so that we don't have to. But in another sense, because Jesus confronted our sin with his own flesh and his own blood, we need to do the same. Jesus constantly calls us to pursue purity and love and holiness so that whenever he does return, we will be ready. And we need to live every day in that pursuit and in that fight so that we'll be ready more and more every day. And in the security provided by Jesus shedding his blood and breaking his flesh and dying and resurrect, being resurrected for us, that security that that offers us, eternal security, salvation in him, that gives us everything we need to be empowered and to face our sin day after day. And even when we fail, we're still secure in that because of his blood. So as we take the cup and we take the bread, please think about um, how, how and why are you faint-hearted? Is it because you're not remembering his blood and his flesh and what he did and how he fought and how he faced our sin for us? In what ways do we need to remember his flesh and his blood? In what ways do we need to be refreshed and empowered to face our own sin in our day-to-day -day life? Um, so please remember that as we uh, take the bread now. Would you stand with us as we sing just the first verse of our closing song?